Kato Katawa. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this very timely Australian Evaluation Society panel discussion on Afghanistan, taking stock and looking forwards. I am Marini Sanka, the regional co-convener of AES Aotearoa, New Zealand. Before we begin, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the diverse lands that we all represent today. I'm hosting this from Wellington, Aotearoa, and I pay homage to our leaders, past, present, and emerging. And just some housekeeping before I introduce the panelists. This session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube um, at some stage in the near future. So except for the panelists, if I can ask you all to keep yourself muted and if you wish to, you may turn off your cameras if you're not comfortable being on YouTube. Um, please feel free to do that um, at any time. And also feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat function. My co-host Andrew Collins will monitor them and read some of them out um, towards the mid to late, se late section of this discussion. And we are, we are really, really fortunate to have the perfect lineup to discuss the current situation faced by many civilians under the Taliban regime and what went wrong. Um, we have three wonderful speakers. Originally a citizen of Kabul, um, but zooming in from California, <clears throat> we have Dr. Hafisa Jastani. Hafisa is a gender and peace education specialist with several years of experience working with international bodies such as the World Bank, UN Women, USAID, and the Swedish Embassy in Kabul to promote human rights, gender equality, and peace in Afghanistan. Her doctoral research in peace and conflict studies investigated peace education in Afghanistan. Um, Andrew, um, can you please let the seven people in the waiting room in? Sure. Um, Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Zooming in from the UK, we have Professor Jonathan Goodhand from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. Jonathan is an expert in, con in conflict analysis and international development in South and Central Asia, especially in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Jonathan's research includes peace building, reconstruction, and the political economy of aid and conflict as illustrated by his project on the opium trade in Afghanistan. Also zooming in from Wellington, Aotearoa, we have Joseph Schumacher. Joseph is an international development expert who is currently the senior evaluation advisor for USAID's Afghanistan Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Activity. He was also the m and &E director of USAID's largest stabilization program in Afghanistan from 2010 to 12, and he drafted DFID's monitoring strategy for Afghanistan after the 214 withdrawal. So we are extremely lucky to have such a knowledgeable, um, distinguished cohort as our panelists. And I welcome you all and, and thank you so much for being part of your panel of this panel discussion. And I'd like to contextualize today's discussion by opening the floor to Hafiza. Um, <clears throat> Hafisa, if you, if you can please tell us a little bit about your experience, about what it was like growing up as a young female um, under, the, under the Taliban regime um, and what it was like to have a professional career um, under the US occupation and also your views on the current challenges faced by civilians today. Good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening, depends uh, where you are. A great panelists and also great participants. Mary, thank you so much. And thanks to your colleague for organizing this uh, discussion. Very timely discussion. Um, I hope we continue this uh, kind of discussion and talk um, to contribute um, to advocate for advocates um, and also to raise Afghanistan people's voice in this hard situation. And let's continue um, 
to be voice of Afghanistan people for a better change. It's a really hard time right now. If I start saying like this year, from very beginning, it was not a good time for us in Afghanistan, particularly for those who are in Kabul or in big cities. We had the bad news, uh, you know, from district level, provincial level. When uh, Taliban took over the district level very easily, it was alarming uh, news. It was um, alarming us in, in, in Kabul. Uh, Yes, uh, when Taliban took over the first time, I was just a senator of 13 or 14 years old. Very different experience. I was at the school. Uh, but be because it was um, in a war, so an internal war, before uh, Taliban took over the first time, I think it was not something similar but not as hard at this time, because this time we had 20 years of progress going on in the country, and then at once Taliban took over. So it was it, 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 totally different experience. This time I'm a woman working, a professional woman working in international organization, and I experienced the 20 years of um, good social progress among people's life, living in, in Kabul. So of course, it was, it is difficult. Uh, talking about the um, challenges, I start saying that we have a government in Afghanistan right now for the last three months that um, is not recognized internationally. And I hope the international community continue not recognize them. Uh, the second challenge is, and the biggest uh, challenge is economic crisis. People who are working did not receive their salary. People have lost their job. Women lost their job. There's no money in the bank. People who have money in the bank, it's just it's stuck. So even they could not access it or cannot access it right now. The third point that I'm going to um, say repeatedly, if it's a big issue right now, is um, about uh, women and girls' education. Girls in school are closed. Girls cannot go to school. Women are not allowed to work. They lost their job. So education sector is a question mark. The education sector is not active. People who were educated, people who were active and contributed to a development program in the last 20 years, whether they left the country, whether they are leaving the country, or they are on the way to leave. So it's very hard. These people are the human resources of this country. Depression at the family level. I give an example of myself. I, with my husband, my two children, we are in California. My father, my mother are still in Kabul. My siblings are all over the, the, the world now. People are receiving threats. It's human rights, no Taliban do not expect. Psychologically, people are in very bad situation. It's a really hard time. Um, and also we lost the social development that we gained it or we achieved it in the last 20 years, we lost it at once, like gone. We have so many other challenges going on, but I say here, because it's, it's 
you put it as a, my personal experience, so I put it in this way. My father received rape and he is hiding in a place because his children work for international organization. I myself and my sibling were working for international organization for more than 10 years. But now my father is under threat, Taliban in Kabul. This is my personal experience, Mary. And I stop here. Thank you. Happy Seth. Um, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that your father um, got, got a threat like that. It's, it's a horrendous, horrendous um, situation that most of us living in the comfortable West cannot, cannot imagine um, what people are enduring. And um, Jonathan, um, this they, sort of segues into your area of speciality. Um, we all know that Afghanistan has been um, colonized and, and um, taken over several times over, over many decades. Um, could, you, could you talk to us a little bit about um, how you think the whole liberal peace building model played out um, and what your views are on in terms of its failures, in terms of state building? Okay, thanks, Mary, and uh, uh, evening, every well, evening here. Good morning to other people, um, and it, it's a pleasure to be on this this panel and with a, a really interesting group of people. Um, I'm going to just before I launch into a, a very short set of thoughts on history and, and lessons, I, I'm going to start with with one. I think really salient and very urgent point. And in some ways, thinking about history and stock taking seems to me at this present moment almost a self-indulgent kind of thing to do, given the, the incredible urgency of the situation in Afghanistan now, as Hafisa has kind of been touching on. Um, I think Hafiza and I have different positions um, in terms of the, the implications of this, but I think we both share a great concern for the kind of crisis that Afghanistan is now facing, which is based on a kind of long-standing drought, um, a kind of skyrocketing levels of poverty and malnutrition, huge levels of displacement in the middle of a, of a pandemic, and, and in a situation where there's a financial crisis and the international community is, is, is freezing the reserves of the the afghan government and and, and that, that those kinds of actions have been described by barney rubin recently as as, as a, a, almost a form of a war crime in the sense or a crime against humanity because of the implications of holding back those reserves for the afghan people at this present moment in time so i think just we ought to be all of us be conscious and cognizant of this situation now. And for me, the question of recognition is, is really almost irrelevant. It, it's about how to engage in this current situation to help the Afghan people. And I, I'm afraid there's no easy options here. There has to be some kind of engagement with the ruling authority in order to deliver assistance at scale. So that's a kind of my first kind of big point which we all need to keep in mind. So I'm going to make three um, or actually four points about history and taking stock. Um, the first thing to say is about um, thinking about the nature of the Afghan state and it's a very simple but really quite salient point in that the Afghan state has always been what we might call a rentier state, a state that has always been dependent on external infusions of resources, whether this came from the Russian and the British empires or whether in the Cold War context from the US and the, former, and, and the Soviet Union, it's always been dependent on external aid. It's always been externally facing and it has never created the tax base to run itself. Um, and therefore, the, what, we, what has never happened in Afghanistan uh, that we've seen in kind of the state building processes in Europe historically is emergence of a fiscal contract. 
a, a state which taxed its population and through that process developed um, reciprocal kinds of institutions. And that's how democracy kind of emerged in, 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 in kind of Europe in the 1800s and 1700s and 1800s. And so that the product of that, this rentier state is something that we see today in the way that Afghan society is bifurcated between what Barney Rubin described as a, as a kind of an enclave urban society, um, increasingly westernized, increasingly educated and literate, um, dependent on this drip feed of external resources, and then uh, a, a rural, more conservative, agrarian-based population, originally kind of based on subsistence uh, and more conservative in its outlook and worldviews, um, detached from those kinds of modernization processes. And, and in many ways, the Taliban emerged from this second kind of constituency from the rural borderlands. And that fault line remains today in Afghan society. And we see it now when we look back on assessments of what happened over the last 20 years and how to engage with the Taliban. And we need to really be conscious of those kinds of fault lines. Um, Mm -hmm. Because we see them around gender politics, we see them around modernization and westernization, we see them around democracy, uh, we see them you know, in relation to tribal society and religious values. We need to keep that in, 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 in our minds. So let's move on now to 2001 and, and the liberal peace building project. And there's three things I want to mention here. One is what we might call the moment of original sin. And that is really the absence of an inclusive political settlement um, in kind of emerged in, in the, you know, through the Bonn Agreement and the, the post Bonn Agreement. Um, what I mean by that is that um, major constituencies in Afghan societies, particularly the Taliban, were not included in, in those negotiations. Um, we know that in 2002, 2003, 2004, um, the Taliban were just wanted to put down their guns. They wanted to retire into their villages. Some of them wanted to kind of be part of politics, but they weren't able to. And they, the US resisted that and so did members of the Northern Alliance. So that fundamental failure of politics at the beginning was a huge failing. There was an opportunity there to, to, to negotiate a more inclusive political settlement, um, to reconfigure the, you know, the, the, 40, you know, well, the 30 odd years of, of, of conflict that had gone prior to that. And the system that emerged um, you know, out of that political settlement was, was fraught with contradictions. On the one hand, the, 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 new, um, the new constitution was one of the most centralized constitutions in the world, a presidential system with power kind of centralized in, in this powerful figure of the president. Parliament really had very limited powers. So you had these formal institutions that are highly centralized alongside informal politics, which was, and, and de facto politics, de facto power relations, which were highly fragmented and decentralized. So there's this massive mis- alignment between formal politics and informal and underlying configurations of power. You know, and that kept playing itself out again and again over the next 20 years. Now, the second point um, that I want to make is that as Western intervention kind of got rolled out and, 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 and new kinds of objectives were piled on to counter-terrorism, including state building, democratization, counter-narcotics, and so on, um, these kind of interventions met resistance. And the response was what Astri Serki calls a kind of critical mass doctrine. So in, in order to overrun, overrule these forms of resistance from the borderlands, from Afghan society, um, and from the Taliban, um, what was needed in, in, the, in the kind of the ideas of critical mass was kind of more financial diplomatic and coercive muscle to overrun and overrule these things. So it's more troops, more funding, uh, 
and more programs to you know, for development and, and governance and counterinsurgency and so on. And this critical mass doctrine just kind of reproduced the, these kinds of contradictions and it, it funded and increased the kind of the rentier dynamics that I talked about. And it also accentuated the problems of corruption and the kind of the auto consumption of aid, um, not only by Afghan political elites, but also by the international system as a whole. And I, I, it's a real bugbear of mine how this discourse of corruption always points the finger at Afghans, but doesn't look at the, 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 the responsibility of international actors in, in fake creating this environment. What do you expect to happen if you pump in huge amounts of resources into a resource scarce environment where politics is fragmented? You know, and not only that, something like over 40% of the aid never even reached Afghanistan. It was consumed mm -hmm. by Beltway bandits in Washington or London or, or wherever, by consultancy firms. You know, so there's a huge amount of corruption within the international system as well. Not, it's not just about Afghans uh, and, and the domestic political economy. So the, this kind of critical mass, mass doctrine, I think, was, was fundamentally problematic. And what Sastri Serki argued was that they need to, you need to do more with less. You need to calibrate funding much more closely to local realities, work with the grain of local politics and open up spaces for political negotiation at the domestic level to happen. And there was a fundamental failure in do it, allowing that to happen and a reliance more and more on kind of coercive power, um, on, 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 on fighting the Taliban um, and, and kind of, in many ways, there was, um, Afghanistan suffered from aid shock in terms of the, the amount of funding that was being channeled into this, um, in, into Afghan society. Okay, so the critical mass doctrine was a problem. The final thing I want to mention is, is the withdrawal, um, because this was a fundamental failure of responsibility on the part of international actors. Um, there is a contradiction um, in the sense that it's clear that international state building, international funding is not the answer to bringing about sustainable peace in Afghanistan. At the same time, the sudden withdrawal of that funding, when the whole political system, the whole political economy is now reliant on funding flows, is an incredibly irresponsible um, thing to do. And it was obvious what would happen if you did that. It would be a descent into spoil politics and the whole pack of cards would fall down. And this is precisely what happened. And it was incredibly irresponsible by the US to you know, engage in the so-called Doha peace process, which basically emboldened the Taliban, undermined the government, um, undermined any, any kind of confidence in the future. And then all these patronage structures started to unravel as it became obvious that the US was not gonna stay, that the, the, the military power would, 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 would be pulled back. And, and so pulling the plug on this, you know, led to this kind of scenario. And we are now in this situation the fin to finish off, um, which goes, you know, going back to my first point, the humanitarian crisis, the financial crisis, um, all these things that are now happening. Western actors need to take some responsibility, a major part of responsibility for creating this situation. And it is absolute abrogation of responsibility now to stand by and say, we can't deal with the Taliban. Um, we can't legitimize them. We're not going to engage. When you international actors have created this situation and there are a huge amount of responsibility to the Afghan people um, for, for helping to mitigate these circumstances in which a lot of people are going to have a very, very difficult winter, and we are on the brink of, of kind of mass starvation. Absolutely. Jonathan, thank you so much for that. Um, I have one very quick question for you before, before um, I move on to Joseph. Um, what's your view on the former government? Did you think they did their job well, governing the nation? A short answer is no, they didn't do their job well. But um, it, it's not a case really of individuals. Um, it's about a political system uh, 
that was created and in which all the incentives operating were towards kind of making money now. Mm. And, uh, you know, there is no kind of long term confidence in the future in that kind of a situation, then, yeah, you try and make money, you do invest your money in Dubai or Europe. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's some, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And for everyone on this call, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat section. We would love to hear from um, people who work in the international development sector, um, NGO workers. We would, we would really love to hear your questions or comments. Um, and Joseph, it, it brings me to you. You know, you, you lived and worked in Kabul as a development practitioner for, for so long. Um, can you please tell us about your, your experiences working for USAID? Um, did you think the aid was very couple centric or did, did you think it was dispersed well across the nation? Um, what, are, what are some of the lessons learned or not learned? We, we, we would love to hear your viewpoints. Thanks, Murray. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And I just want to say, um, um, Habisa um, and Jonathan, you know, it's a really pleasure uh, to be um, on this panel with you. Jonathan, um, that was fascinating. I'd actually love to travel to London and take your course now, I think. Um, and I absolutely really, um, agree with everything you had to say. Um, and I probably come from this from a slightly different angle, um, which is the sort of development uh, professional and, you know, working for these different um, donor organisations. Um, yeah, I mean, the last year has been really difficult, you know, for everyone, obviously, in Afghanistan, um, and less so, I guess, for the international donor uh, community and those involved with that. Um, and I think, you know, everyone's sort of kind of picking themselves still off the floor. Um, it was a very traumatizing experience, I think, for the organizations involved um, and for the individuals. Mm. And I think we're only sort of now beginning to do that kind of stop taking and actually sort of absorbing the lessons. And it's really difficult because you've sort of got the, you know, there's so many different ways of looking at it. You've got the dimensions of the political um, economy uh, dimension, which Jonathan, you know, really succinctly and sort of um, just did such a great job, I think, in describing. Um, you've got the kind of uh, pre-academic sort of, ang you know, dimension of actually how, what mistakes did we make? and they were copious and I think you know if we've got years and years to try and actually you know it's it, it's going to take a long time to actually sort of work through that um, and then just you know at the same time there's also the ongoing um, tragedy um, and our responsibilities I think and the world's responsibilities now to actually not just leave Afghanistan um, in this you know really dire moment um, I guess what I can add to the discussion is that at the same time, we've also got to talk about, you know, there has been this effort over the last two decades to create a modern state in Afghanistan mm -hmm. with all the trappings that involved. Um, and so things were achieved, um, you know, and I think if you want to talk about what was achieved over the, you know, with the help of the donors over the last 20 years, that's also a valid discussion. Um, and you know, I think, you know, the human security indices, um, especially in health and education, really did improve over the last 20 years. And I think, you know, you can't, that's a, you know, fairly sort of, um, you can look at that objectively. Um, and then that discussion about everything that's gone wrong and all the mistakes, this sort of, you know, this need to kind of almost kind of take into account the political, where obviously it was, fairly disastrous, the military and the development and how they intersect is really important. I think um, if you're just sort of looking at it from the kind of uh, an evaluation point of view in development, you know, I think um, those improvement in the human development indices, a lot of that was actually down to the donor work over the last 20 years. And what I would say is that, you know, that basic package for the health services that uh, provides all of the uh, the medical care to Afghans um, in all 34 um, provinces and getting those nine to 10, you know, nine to 10 million 
Afghan children into school that otherwise wouldn't have been in there over the last 20 years. You know, these are things that shouldn't be forgotten. And I think what you have to look at is sort of it's really important to understand what systems have been built over the last 20 years um, that have improved the lives of Afghans. And then, um, and it's important to sort of understand how those systems and how they improved services so that we can understand what's important to try and preserve now That's and then how to actually save those systems that will be built. So I can sort of give you like, you know, just from my limited experience, sort of a, a brief overview of some of the systems that I know of and, you know, how um, evaluation can play its part as well. That would be wonderful, Joseph. <laughs> and, you know, I think all the other sort of part of the discussion is also sort of look at how donor investment has actually really transformed the attitudes and expectations of many Afghans. And here's where, you know, we, we, um, Jonathan were talking, we, when Jonathan was talking about those fissures in society, that's really very important to also keep in mind. Because um, there's just been sort of so much work, you know, Afghanistan bans, sorry, Afghanistan's almost been this petri dish in terms of actually public surveying about expe um, expectations and attitudes. Um, there's been so much work done, you know. Um, yeah. So I think some of those systems that I've sort of had personal experience evaluating, you know, I would sort of talk about the basic healthcare packages from the Ministry of Public Health, um, the really important improvements in the reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent um, services. Mm -hmm. And all of these are sort of underpinned by like a whole array of different systems. You know, you've got training for midwives, you've got the um, uh, accreditation programs for nurses and doctors. And that's leaving aside, of course, all of the infrastructure that's been built and the equipment, um, surfaces around um, the health, uh, what's called HMIS, that's the health management information systems. So that's this kind of huge IT effort, you know, where essentially, you know, so there was this incredible effort to almost sort of drag Afghanistan, drop them into like a 21st century modern IT centric um, world. Um, and so obviously there were, you know, massive mistakes made and some programs were better than others. Um, and, but what was retrieved? I mean, you have to sort of look at the end of, you know, at the specific individual evaluations, I think, to actually, you know, really to understand that. Um, I think other things such as, you know, there was a sort of this real effort to actually kind of introduce professionalization to these um, social service um, sectors, whether it was nurses or midwives or doctors or teachers, um, home health care workers, um, social workers. For the first time, there was a, you know, a sense that actually these are professional industries. Sorry, one sec. make sure I didn't run out of power. Um, and I think that's like a really important dynamic that was going on. Um, the use of CSOs and NGOs and the service care as service care providers and contractors, you know, which is something we're very used to here in New Zealand, but that's a fairly radical transformation. And it almost sort of, it was one really important driver into civil society, you know, because suddenly there was this plethora of contracts being offered at the very local level. Um, and it actually gave some, I think, you know, it's sort of, um, you've got this dynamic where you've got some NGOs and CSOs, which were just suddenly sort of mushroomed up and would disappear. But the ones that stayed um, and certain donors, you know, had sort of this kind of, you know, we're going to find our champions and organizational sustainability. And these were all very, I think, you know, sort of important things that we're going to have to try and better understand as we seek to find those local organizations and local actors that can still work, you know, that the international community can hopefully engage with in Afghanistan. Because, you know, really we do have to have local solutions now. Um, the medical chain, sorry, the medical supply chain and the distribution systems that were built, these were really, um, uh, really important with ASMO. Um, and all of these things, you know, uh, probably, I don't know, but I imagine they'd be teetering right now. So, you know, hopefully um, the international donor community is figuring out how we can 
you know, carry on to support those systems um, and not, you know, let all those gains um, just disappear. Um, the school book supply system, we were doing an evaluation on that, you know, that was really important. Um, DABS, which is the national electricity provider with the PTEC um, uh, main trunk line going sort of north to south down through the country. You know, that um, electrification, we just done a huge evaluation on how electricity changes life outcomes for those households. Mm -hmm. And we'd seen, you know, like electrification had gone from, you know, I don't know, the, I don't have the figures on my head, you know, I'm on the top of my head, but it was like less than 10% to, you know, towards the 30s and 40s now and much higher in urban areas. And that electrification was beginning to go to those rural areas. And what that does to households, to, you know, children's, to literacy or to um, the use of um, uh, decision-making around heat sources and all of those things. And just, you know, um, so that's all very important to understand. And it'll be, you know, really um, critical to mm. keep engaging with Afghanistan on those Absolutely. things. Um, I think there are certainly lessons around donor coordination and evaluation and the um, ARTF program, I think was a really important one. This was the large trust fund. Um, Cause I think, you know, if you sort of talk now to, I think at some stage we're going to have this, this reflection period and maybe this is the beginning of that, you know um, and how we do, how the donor communities actually work in these very fragile states in a better way. And I think discussions around trust funds um, rather than sort of, you know, for donor coordination is probably really important. In regards to gender and democracy and governance programs, you know, um, it's a lot been a lot more difficult to evaluate and it's proved a lot more ephemeral because it's so vulnerable to the wider political environment. Um, and that's probably a very worthwhile discussion around having. I will say that, you know, while some programs were better than others, there was a lot for people to be proud of and a lot of changes did take place. And at the same time, now that they've changed expectations, because that's what they've done, you know, they've really created um, an aggregate. You know, they created a new vision for two generations of Afghans about what they expect from their state and their lives in terms of, you know, that gender empowerment, the democracy and governance programming. And then to suddenly have that sort of pulled away from them as um, um, Havisa alluded to is, you know, beyond words um, in terms of the tragedy. Um, so, you know, I think we do have to sort of take a step back and I think networking and actually figuring out what local networks still exist and how we can work with them without putting them in any further peril is gonna be really important. Yeah. Um, and then there's a sort of very large discussion around coin and counterinsurgency. And whether any of those theories change, whether any of those theories of change, which we were using for 10 years about, you know, the economic transformation in the rural South that we were seeking around moving farmers into like high value crops and whether that was going to have any effect on the interrelationships and the dependencies between different groups and whether have, you know, pulling people out of conflict and into productive lives, whether that has any validity down. I mean, obviously it was a catastrophe. And I think, you know, you know, the whole, that whole era is thankfully gone. And the donor community themselves had pivoted away from it five years ago or so. But um, certainly of historical and academic and pracademic interest. Um, but I'll finish there because I think hopefully we can have some time for discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Joseph, for that very illuminating, eye-opening um, window into the lessons in the aid sector. Um, Andrew, I will, I will hand it over to you to, um, to ask some questions in the chat function. And everyone, Andrew Collins is a PhD candidate from King's College London um, in the Department of War Studies. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Marie. And thank you to all of the panelists and the audience for being here. Uh, I'm just gonna try to summarize some of the questions people have been sending me through uh, direct messages as well as putting into the, the global chat, um, as well as asking a few of my own. Um, and th these were all really interesting and, and varied perspectives. And I, I think you've raised some important issues. Um, I wanna start with something perhaps Joseph, you picked up on. 
uh, the space for evaluation now? Because Hafiza and Jonathan, you sort of outlined a, a profile of a crisis in, in full swing right now with the drought, the pandemic, the, the economic problems, and people not being able to get their money from banks, the, the trade flows drying up and supply chains being disrupted. And all of this is, is very problematic for daily life in Afghanistan, for, for the ways people do business and expect things to happen in the future. Is evaluation what people need in a crisis? And how do we make space for reflection and, and give people opportunities to actually learn the lessons from history? Uh, I, I don't know if you'd like to speak on this one by one or if I can uh, throw a few more questions at you and, and different people can uh, have a go at choosing the ones they like. Um, but I'll, I'll just put a couple more on the table. Is there a way that the international community can use conditionality at this point to, to prioritize certain uh, aspects of the agenda they'd like to see for political reform and, and to sort of keep the Taliban vaguely in line with international norms on human rights, uh, things like this? Is, is there a space for conditionality to be used around uh, preserving the gains made in the education sector, for example, and, and around women's rights. And to what extent do you think there's a trade-off between that and pursuing counter in, or counter radical counter terrorism and uh, radicalization agendas? Are, are the is the political capital of the donor community expended as as they gain concessions from the Taliban in one area, such that they would be less able to uh, manage to persuade them in other areas. I, I'm hoping this makes sense. And uh, I'll, I'll put another one out for now. Um, there's a few more, but I'm wondering what's the fate of the people who've remained behind in Afghanistan? Are these possibly people who can be worked with uh, without necessarily engaging directly with the government. These, these mushroom NGOs and CSOs and, and uh, some of the medical leaders and, and legal professionals and university lecturers and so forth who didn't uh, leave the country or who may not have had that chance, are these people who can provide alternative sites of intervention? You want us to come in now, Andrew? Or? Oh, sure. Um, I, I was just hoping that. Sorry, well, I uh, thought you were like waiting. I didn't know what you're reading there. Sorry, no, no my, my monitor just froze for a second. Um, would you, could we go through in, in perhaps the order uh, in which the, the panelists spoke? And, and we'll begin with Hafiza and, and then Jonathan's and then Joseph's uh, opinions about any of these you'd like to, to comment on. Thank you. Thank you so much. I start with um, working with people who are in Kabul and overall Afghanistan right now um, as a possibility, you know, supporting those people who are in the country right now. Yes, of course. Um, there are many group of um, professional left in the country and they all, uh, of course, uh, want to um, help people, first help them themselves and, you know, and then the uh, people around them in the community. Mm. Um, there are still people who are in, in, in big cities and also in the provincial level. Um, like last time, the first time the Taliban took over the country, we had this um, angels working with um, local people, and of course, this time, as uh, Joseph mentioned, we have we have a very good networking um, among the uh, civil society. I totally agree with Joseph. We have some angels who are really uh, good and uh, sustainable work for um, the development of the country. They are still in the country, some of them, or even. We have some of the angels who, like <laughs> the word mushroom humans, and yes, still, you know, they all um, hand to give help to the people. 
Um, I, I think uh, some of the international actor or activists um, already started working them with them. Um, I know some group of people already start, you know, teaching online to students um, at the university level and working together. So they, they um, work possible, still possible to work with them. And your question about, you know, putting conditionality to a Taliban or working with the Taliban government, maybe other or not agree with me, or maybe I'm coming from Afghanistan as a woman, uh, experienced all these things in the country. Uh, um, I'm saying um, not to recognize Taliban government. And the reason why, I have some points to mention um, later on in the discussion. Um, Instead of working with Taliban, it's better to uh, make a joint effort and fighting with them. Why this um, extremist group should exist in a country like Afghanistan or any uh, place in the world. Instead of working with them, I think it's better to um, fight with them. <laughs> I, I put it in this way. Maybe I'm so emotional, I'm coming from the country, but this is my uh, perception right now about uh, Taliban, because within Taliban, there's Al Qaeda group, very extremist group, and they are in power and they are active. So that's why I'm saying uh, working with them instead of working with them or putting con condition, uh, it's better to make a joint effort fight with them. Uh, I have some other reason. Uh, I will share that later on. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hafiza. And um, if uh, Jonathan and Joseph have anything to, to add, or I, I noticed there's a little bit of disagreement over the, the level to which it's worth uh, pursuing the fight against the Taliban or recognizing them or partly conditionally recognizing them or the, the degree of importance which should be attached to this. Um, but perhaps uh, the other panelists have some uh, opinions they, they would uh, like to share on that. Yeah, I, I realize I'm on sensitive ground here as a, as a non-Afghan, but as somebody who has worked on Afghanistan and, and lived there for over 30 years and with a lot of Afghan friends, um, I do you know, have a strong feeling for the country and a commitment towards it. But I, I respectfully differ from what Hafiza said just now. I think um, it's a fact that the Taliban are the ruling authority. It's also a fact that any alternative to the Taliban at this moment in time is far worse than the Taliban. You only have to see um, Daesh and what they're doing at the moment. Not only that, though, any forms of armed resistance to the Taliban would be an absolute disaster for the Taliban, sorry, for the Afghan people at the moment. The last thing any of my Afghan friends want at the moment is more fighting. So I think the issue is not about international recognition. International recognition is not on the table and the Taliban are not even expecting international recognition anytime soon. The issue at the moment is around engagement and that leads me to the second question about conditionality. The track record of conditionality in any context, internationally in the context of aid or state building, has been pretty appalling. And I would challenge anyone to kind of show examples where conditionality has consistently worked or credibly worked. What has to happen now is some form of engagement because I, I was an NGO worker myself for many years. So I, I am a strong supporter of NGOs. So NGOs by themselves are not going to deal with this current crisis. To go to scale, as you know, UNICEF and World Food Programme are arguing, you know, this involves talking to and engaging with the kinds of systems um, that Joseph was talking about. You know, there, there are some systems in place and the Taliban, there's an interesting 
um, question in the in in the chat as well about what about the people um, leaving the country um, who have kind of helped set up these systems. The Taliban is falling over backwards to say it doesn't want these educated people to leave and it wants to engage with the community international community to deliver these things it has a vested interest in addressing this crisis now you could argue that okay well we we, we undermine the taliban so that it collapses and use the crisis as a way of, of doing that that for, for the afghan people that would be an absolute disaster and a total abrogation of of responsibility so i think we have to look at interest uh, kind of creative ways of kind of working with systems that are in place and that, that will involve conversations with you know this thing called the taliban which is not monolithic by the way there's there's differences within the taliban our past experience of megaphone diplomacy and sanctions is that it simply strengthens the hardliners that's what happened in the 1990s so there has to be some kind of engagement with certain groups within the Taliban and, and recognize actually there are a lot of divisions between more radical um, groups and, 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 and more moderate ones, those who believe more in, in, in politics and diplomacy in the states and those who have come from a military and a much more radical background. Um, the final thing to say you know, about NGOs and civil societies, as I say, I worked with them and for them for many years and one of the kind of stories about NGOs that is not very often told is how the support for NGOs in the 1980s and 1990s was very important in holding in cold storage a, a kind of class of, of educated people who re-emerged in 2001 and, and became, you know, people like Hanif Atmar became the, you know, became ministers. So, you know, I think investing in these people, um, which is where I, I definitely agree with Hafisa, you know, investing in those people in, and, and protecting them is a very important investment in the future. And, and you know, they, they may be space for them moving into government positions, into positions of authority in, in, in the future. Um, but it's not, it's not going to happen if we, you know, if we, if we kind of shout conditionalities and, 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 and use sanctions to try and leverage and get what we want, because it's just not, it's going to have a, 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 um, a perverse effect. Makes sense. And uh, Joseph, anything to add? Yeah, I just sort of say that, you know, the, obviously the, the first thing, you know, to acknowledge is that there will be, there is a um, humanitarian crisis and that has to be dealt with first, you know, um, going into winter, um, like already there's food shortages and over the next year, you know, the um, economy could contract 20, 30, 40%. Um, you know, we've sort of seen these kind of figures being bandied around. So we are sort of dealing with the, like ambulance at the bottom of the cliff kind of stuff. And we just have to hope with the international uh, community. And I believe they are, they are rallying around and they're trying to figure out, you know, how they deal with that crisis first and all the other questions about, recognition i think are sort of hopefully on the back burner i don't know but i imagine you know that's how they're proceeding in terms of um evaluation you know i think it's really interesting actually says you know how you know it's not a monolithic country it's a very complex country though um certainly in the in the north i believe the taliban are somewhat of a occupying power still in terms of the ideology and in terms of um you know, the sentiment of, you know, large swaths of the people um, and actually how the international community can, you know, um, begin to work with the forces of moderation. I'm sorry, that's a very sort of vague term, but, you know, there will certainly be, you know, there'll be ordinary people out there who will, um, who will want to work with um, whoever, to improve their lives and the lives of their, uh, you know, their um, local uh, communities. Now, for evaluation, I, I guess it's sort of figuring out, you know, as actually these things, and they will happen organically, as, you know, the international community at the governmental level, but also how the international um, NGO community actually engages, figuring out when things are working and why, 
and how to sort of empower those forces of, of um, moderation. And also then, you know, as reform agendas sort of organically crop up in different areas of Afghanistan, how, what we can do to help them. And whether it's sort of online learning for girls or, you know, interfaith dialogues, I don't know. We can't really sort of, you know, prognosticate now as to what they're going to be. But certainly as evaluators, there will be a role for us to play. And it'll be sort of more research rather than, you know, you know, programmatic evaluation. But there'll be interesting hybrids cropping up, I'm sure. You know, and also a lot of stuff will be happening behind closed doors, you know, behind the, the doors of, of homes and things like that. And how, you know, so um, Kafisa mentioned, you know, these very powerful, no, very real networks of, of women and NGOs and moderate religious leaders and just networks, because that's Afghanistan. It's a very highly networked society. So whatever we can do to help those forces with moderation, you know, we have to do. Speaking of networks um, and the, the whole financial crisis, there, there is a question um, in the chat about um, what your thoughts are in terms of unfreezing the assets. How difficult is it? And what are the chances of that happening anytime soon so that people won't starve and freeze? Jonathan, would you like to have a have a go at that? Yeah, I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but I, it, it's very easy to do it. Um, what, what's stopping it from happening are a set of kind of political kind of calculations and, and pressures. And I mean, I think it, it's also important to say that unfreezing these assets is not the key is not the answer to this um, to this crisis. It, it's part of potentially the solution. Um, I mean, the the, the former finance min minister um, um, Payenda has had a very interesting interview with the Afghan analyst network, and and he he was arguing not for a carte blanche um, kind of releasing uh, of, of these funds, but perhaps releasing installments of it as part of a kind of a conversation and part of the bargaining process. Um, you know, but I mean, I, I it's, my understanding is the, the, the US in particular, but the EU, they're, they're you know, against, um, they're, they're, they're you know, against the re with them releasing the funds, and they're taking a position of um, a very circumspect form, uh, circumspect about any form of engagement with the Taliban. Um, you know, that, that is part of the picture, anyway. Then it's an important part of the picture. The other part of the picture is is the one you know, that Joseph has mentioned is about the humanitarian aid and getting that delivered at scale as quickly as possible. Um, and that will have to involve some kind of disagreement with the Taliban and sectors of the state that, that have kind of capacity mm -hmm. to deliver services. Absolutely. Um, since we only have about two minutes left, I, I would like to open it up to the panel. Um, just to ask you, how you think the international community, we being part of the international community, can do our best to help the people of Afghanistan? Hafisa, would you would you like to comment on that? Uh, thank you, Mary, and um, thank you, Jonathan. Very impressive uh, response and information. Um, again, I start <laughs> with my point, like. First of all, um, continue to not recognize Taliban um, as, a, as a government because they are not inclusive. And I'm saying not inclusive because um, minority group are under pressure, first of all. Minority group um, are many, but Hazara group is first. I am in Hazara, Atram Hazara community as well. Um, they, we are under pressure. They kill us on the spot. 
So that's what I'm saying. Uh, working with this government in Afghanistan, not a good solution. Women are not included. Taliban uh, group do not respect human rights, do not respect women's rights, do not respect children's rights. So even you put conditional, like international community put conditionality and recognize them or not recognize them, even make a, uh, you know, way of communication, dealing with them or working with them, then how they will stop these things like, uh, you know, push, pressuring the minority group in Afghanistan. This is, I think, not possible. I asked the international community that within the Taliban group, Al Qaeda group is very active and on, uh, in power and practicing power right now. So now it's Afghanistan, but similar will happen, similar threat will happen in the world. Of course, we have Daesh group going on and they are experiencing their power in the country as well. But how international community, uh, you know, work with this one, the Al-Qaeda group was. I, you know, as Afghan women, I request from international community that please do not keep silent. Please do not leave Afghanistan alone. It's a matter of millions of people there. I said, do you think you are uh, humanitarian support? People are really in need to receive that. But more important, it's better that they came together and uh, make a decision and make an, a joint effort fighting with terrorist group. Is it Daesh, is it Al Qaeda? Or Taliban. They are similar group with similar uh, objective. They are the threat of the world, not in Afghanistan. I say not in Afghanistan. Afghan people are experiencing this uh, crisis, um, this um, threats or this uh, hard life experience. But soon the international community will, uh, you know, experience the threat from, from this uh, group. So better that they come together sooner than later. Not this year, it's next year, or two years, or three years, less or less or um, soon. They are a threat for all the world. I know people will not be agree with me, but this is me, you know, living in Afghanistan, even right now, like physically, I'm in, not in the country, I'm out of the country, but I know how people are experiencing Taliban's government in Afghanistan. I know how the pressure people inside the country, the minority group, I stop. Thank, Thank you so much, Hafiza, for your honest, um, honest response there. Um, Joseph and Jonathan, do you have any final, final words before we have to close this wonderful panel discussion? Jonathan, do you want the last word? Why don't I just quickly go ahead? I think you do a better job summing it up. <laughs> go ahead. I don't necessarily want the last word, but go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, you know, I hope the international uh, community doesn't look away. That's all. Um, I think, you know, the Afghans are an incredibly smart, savvy, resilient people. I, you know, I love them. Um, and um, I think it's going to be, I think history is going to move pretty fast. And I don't think, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen. But um, I don't, you know, it's not going to be a repetition of previous Eras. I, I just don't know what's going to happen. I just think the expectations and attitudes within of 
you know, of the Afghan people have changed after the last 20 years. And the world's moving too fast, you know, with the kids and their cell phones and stuff. Who knows? Uh, anyway, um, so I just hope we don't look away. That's all. Yeah, we're going over time now, so I'll be really quick. Um, I, I reinforce the point that Jay's just made about not looking away, because last time international actors did look away, um, Afghanistan descended into civil war and uh, we, we, we got. So I think engaging, um, and I think there's two key areas where we've things have got to be done. One is, is aid and the humanitarian crisis and, and uh, major funding um, at this moment. And, and we're talking about over the next weeks and over the, and, and over the winter period. The second thing is the, the political process. We haven't really talked a lot about the political process and what it may look like. Um, but I think, you know, there is a, a um, Hafiza is absolutely right that the Taliban um, are not ruling inclusively they don't represent all Afghans, and there's a need for a political process to bring about greater level of inclusion. And international actors has an important role to play. And I guess something we haven't talked about is how regional actors are a very important part of the this kind of power constellation. And uh, in many ways, Afghanistan, in some ways, could be seen as this a manifest station of this shift of power eastwards and you know the, the, the growing importance obviously of China um, and I, I think engaging with regional actors around a, a political process which in, will involve the Taliban who are not the same as Al-Qaeda who are not the same as Daesh we have to be clear about what we're dealing with here and not conflate them with other actors um, they will have to be part of this political process, as will other actors in Afghan society, including, of course, minorities, including, of course, women. But there has to be a political process is that, um, that's supported over the, over the medium to longer term. Thank you so much, Jonathan, Hafisa, Joseph and Andrew. Thank you for being a great co-host, Andrew, and for helping me out with the chat section. I'd like to thank the panelists for um, their intelligent and thought-provoking um, provocations and answers to our questions. We learn so much from listening to your sometimes diverse viewpoints. And um, I, from the bottom of my heart, I, I really hope the people of Afghanistan would not suffer, would not continue to suffer for too long. And on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for, um, for your time. Thank you for joining us in this panel discussion. Um, I'm sure you all do fantastic work um, in, your, in your normal private lives, if it's either in the NGO sector or the academia or, or in government. Um, yes, let's, um, let's hope for the best. Hope for the best and keep, keep um, Afghanistan in our thoughts and minds. Thank you, everyone.